Hey everyone, Joe Burnett here. I am subbing in for Will Clemente as he is out this week. We're gonna kick off Blockware Intelligence Newsletter week 19. So taking a look at this first chart, this is just a you know Bitcoin price action update. And this week has kind of been more of the same for Bitcoin, basically a range bound shop. You know, Bitcoin, uh, as you can see on the line, it's it's respecting its its volume weighted average price, and so this kind of tells us that that despite you know price being in a clear downtrend, buyers still main you know on a significant level of control since we hit that that bottom around forty two thousand. Basically, uh, Will wrote this in the newsletter. He basically said a true sign that Bitcoin is gearing up for a run higher would be to see the price break above the previous uh, resistance at 53,000. And he also said that we could use this current downtrend line as an early sign of a rally. But until we cross 53, uh, it's, it's gonna be tough to get too confident on, on you know, the short term future price action of, of Bitcoin. Now we're gonna move on to a little bit of on-chain and derivatives update. Basically, with the, with the FOMC, you know, Fed news uh, being a buy the news event, as we are anticipating on Twitter, we were anticipating, Bitcoin had a nice move off, off the uh, lows that we saw Wednesday. However, you know, looking at price action, Bitcoin is, like I said, still in a downward trend. We're still waiting for the market to show some strength by at least breaking out of this local downtrend. And then hopefully, you know, above. 53,000 for us to, to really be confident that that Bitcoin price is, is gaining some short term momentum. What's interesting about 53,000 is that it's not just, you know, like a, T, a, a key technical up, but it's, it's actually the, the roughly the $1 trillion market cap threshold for Bitcoin. Now, in addition to this, uh, the 53,000 level, we actually can look at the on-chain cost basis. And this is also, you know, currently sitting at the short-term realized price, currently sitting at 53,000 as well. This is basically the average price that investors paid for their coins that have been in the market for less than 155 days. So in a way, this is kind of the on-chain volume weighted average price. So next, let's move on to looking at Sopra. Um, but we're going to adjust the data here to a 30-day moving average to get a more cleaner, uh, broader, medium to long-term view. So Sopra, which stands for Spit Output Profit Ratio, compares the amount of profit versus loss being realized on every given day. So the idea here is in, bull mark, in a bull market, Investors aren't willing to sell at a loss. Uh, in a bear market, investors are looking to sell at every chance they get, you know, to break even or just to get out of the market. So the one threshold that you can see on this chart, that black line, serves basically as a medium between the state of profit and loss for these, you know, short-term holders from an on-chain basis. And basically, when you know, when the market participants are realizing losses in aggregate. When above market, oh, so when below market participants are realizing losses in aggregate, but when above the line, market participants are realizing profits in aggregate. Now in 2017, Bitcoin didn't break below the one threshold on the 30 day moving average, not one time. Once below, uh, it kind of got rejected off each underside retest of one after getting back above one following COVID. One served as support in September of last year, but never got retested until breaking below in May. After finally breaking above in early August, we saw a pretty clean retest at the end of September. However, we have recently broken below one without a bounce. Similar to short-term holler cost basis, until breaking above one, we're just kind of gonna be maintaining caution from this metric. Now, uh, looking at the short-term hodler profit-loss ratio 
using a 14-day moving average. This is barely, very similar to SOPRA. The difference between SOPRA looks at realized profit and loss, while this looks at unrealized profit and loss. Specifically, short-term holders. Basically, entities who have held their BTC for less than 155 days. The concept here is very similar to SOPRA. One black line is a neutral level of profit loss being above. Being above, short-term holders are sitting in a state of profit, while below, short-term holders are sitting in a state of loss. You know, in bull markets, market participants are unwilling to sell their Bitcoin at a loss. And in bear markets, the market participants are looking to sell at every opportunity they get to break even and exit the market. Now, just like we saw with confluence of nearly textbook retests and resets of numerous metrics at the end of September, we are now seeing confluence of being in territory of caution for several metrics. As mentioned above, and hope, you know, Will says, hopefully I'm not getting too redundant with some of these explanations. Fair con confirmation would be failed underside retests of these metrics. So that's some of the you know doom and gloom metrics that, that Will uh, was looking at from, from some of the on-chain data. But here is some derivatives data. First, open interest dominance, uh, which compares perpetual open interest to market cap to get a relative weighting to the importance of derivatives versus spot. We were cautious leading into the flush two weeks ago, but reset the metric back to the lowest level since May earlier this year. Still overall in a healthy area, but have started to see a bit of open interest buildup since the flush. Don't think these are aggressive longs because aggregated funding has been muted and even flipped negative on Tuesday. And here's the open interest dominance chart. So continuing uh, on this, this metric right here for supply stock ratios, we're continuing to see a clear bullish divergence between a liquid supply and the price of Bitcoin. Meaning supply continues to move to entities with a low history of selling. Last time we saw a divergence this strong was late September. This tells us that the demand side and the supply is getting locked up, but not on the demand side. For confirmation that this divergence is playing out and the demand is stepping in, we can watch price that action, which is why I've continued to talk about reclaiming that 53,000 level. Price levels and price action can be used to confirm what we're seeing you know, in actual on-chain data. On a final note, um, it's interesting thing to, to see that the inflow of Bitcoin into the Purpose ETF, which is a spot Bitcoin ETF in Canada, uh, the fund has seen roughly $240 million of Bitcoin dollars worth of Bitcoin in the last two weeks amidst the drawdown. And it's now holding roughly a total of 1.5 billion Bitcoin. Now we're gonna move on to equities in general. And this was uh, mainly done by, by Blake Davis. So we're seeing yet another choppy week of price action just in the general market. This environment will force you to feed, force feeds you discipline or it will punish you for not showing. Last week, I discussed the concept of a flow through day, FTD. If you missed it, go ahead and go back to the last week and read that section. This week on Wednesday, we got a long awaited FTD on both S&P and NASDAQ. This was the signal of a potential uptrend forming in both of these major indexes. The price action came alongside the highly anticipated FOMC meeting that we'll talk Books became extremely bullish after Wednesday's price action, but one day of strength isn't enough to declare all of our worries should be gone. Many investors were punished Thursday when technology saw stocks sold off hard. FTD, FTDs are never a guarantee, and sometimes they can fail. When there's a, a distribution day within a few days of the FTD, the likelihood of an FTD failing increases by a lot. A DD is a day where any index, when it's down, where it's down greater than 0.2% on volume larger than the previous day. 
So on Thursday, tech stocks sold off hard, but the NASDAQ and S&P didn't trade enough volume to declare it a distribution day, according to the definitions above. While we don't see ADD on the indexes, we did see one on the NASDAQ ETF, which is QQQ. This didn't technically count as the distribution day came on ETF, but not the index itself. But still a strong sell-off day after the FTD is never a good sign. This raises some big alarms for me as it appears the sell-off is likely to continue. We can expect to see even more volatility on Friday as it's the quad witching day. Quad witching days only happen four times a year and they occur when index features, index options, stock options, and stock features all expire on the same day, meaning there's gonna be a lot of trading. So Blake suggests to proceed with caution in this environment. Now, what does all this mean for crypto exposed stocks? Obviously, this is not a strong environment for crypto stocks in the short term. One look at the charts of previous leaders like SI and Coin can tell us that these stocks are likely going to need sufficient time to build out bases. In the meantime, keep an eye out on the group and note which stocks are showing the most trade. Currently, one of the strongest stocks in the market is Customers Bank Corp. CUBI is a traditional bank that has reimagined itself to begin offering crypto related services to customers this year. Despite the vast majority of tech, of tech markets selling off Thursday, CBUI actually broke out from its recent range. To me, this is the most interesting of these services is the creation of their own stablecoin. It's the CBI token, CBIT token. This allows CUBI to join one of the few banks who offer instant crypto asset settlement. Now the fight against the tide is, is something that should catch our eye. Thursday, it got higher about 2.7% and trended, trended strongly up, with, up for the most of the day. It closed with a price up about 8.3% on volume that was pretty significant. Now the current buy price is, is far too extended from the range that, that Blake would prefer to be buying at. But if CUBI truly is a market leader beginning in, in a new, multi-week run, there will, there will be more opportunities to enter this, this very interesting uh, equity. Now, historically, stocks that bite the trend the hardest tend to be the strongest names once the sell pressure, selling pressure comes off the indexes. But Friday will be a key day as we close the weekly bar. Blake notes that he started a position in CUBI on Wednesday. Now we're moving on to the section that I did. Uh, Bitcoin mining. Looking at some of the key mining metrics for this week, hash rate hit 177.2 exahash, which is very significant. Hash price now sitting at 25 cents, which is downtrending from where it has been over the last you know month, but it's still very profitable for almost all miners to be mining currently. The estimated difficulty adjustment, you know, a few days since the last difficulty adjustment is projected to be slightly negative. Uh, we'll see if that most likely slips slightly positive by the end of, of uh, this, this difficulty epoch. As far as fees percent, percentage of block reward, uh, they're still relatively low compared to what we saw earlier this year at 1.3%. And total mining revenue uh, for the whole Bitcoin network is still sitting at about 50 million uh, per day which is awesome. Basically for my section, I created a report that I published this week. It was titled, Why the 2020s Will Be a Golden Age for Bitcoin Mining. And this will just be a quick summary of that report, but I highly encourage you to check it out on our website. So the general idea was Bitcoin will be highly profitable for the next decade because of two simple ideas. Price will continue to exponentially grow over the long run and hash rate growth will continue to slow. The price of Bitcoin will continue to exponentially increase due to future mass adoption and increasing scarcity. Price growth is accelerating due to mining firms becoming large enough to capitalize on cheap public market financing. As more miners access public equity and debt markets, they can fund their operating expenses 
and hold all, all of the coins they mine. As you can see, Glassnode data currently supports this already. As the price goes up, it becomes increasingly important that, that this you know, sell pressure naturally for miners is removed. Currently at about 50 million Bitcoin mined per day, dollars worth of Bitcoin mined per day, that equates to about 18 billion Bitcoin dollars worth of Bitcoin mined per year. That's a significant amount of capital. So in addition to public miners, you have companies like MicroStrategy adopting Bitcoin as their treasury reserve asset. In a way, they are synthetic Bitcoin miners. They have the ability to borrow money at very cheap interest rates to purchase Bitcoin and remove more coins from the market. While price is growing, hash rate growth is actually slowing. Now this is happening for two key reasons. One is ASIC commoditization, and two is lack of scalable cheap energy. Nowadays, new machines are no longer 100x more efficient within a couple of years. ASICs have become increasingly more efficient on a joules per terahash basis, but that marginal growth is slowing. This means that new ASICs today have the potential for last for seven plus years. If the price of Bitcoin continues to exponentially grow and ASICs continue to commoditize, then it will become clear over the next eight years that a major, major bottleneck to hash rate growth is simply accessible, scalable, cheap energy. Now, the issue with energy production being a bottleneck is that companies cannot spin up new energy production facilities like a large nuclear power unit overnight. These facilities take a minimum of multiple years to plan and fully build. So the point of this, this thread was to basically illustrate why I think Bitcoin mining is a fantastic energy to have exposure to during this phase of Bitcoin to, to adoption. As you can see in this chart, there will only be 500,000 coins left to be mined after the year 2030 for, for, the, for all of eternity. So this next decade will be crucial to be mining Bitcoin and accumulating as many coins as possible. Thank you guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed this week's newsletter and I hope you guys have a great weekend.